Hi, friends. Welcome to the Pain-Free Birth Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Welton, a certified doula, childbirth educator, and mother of three. In this space, we'll hear positive, supernatural, and yes, even pain-free birth stories from women just like you. We'll explore the deeply spiritual side of childbirth and how God designed women's bodies brilliantly for birth. Let's get started. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Pain-Free Birth Podcast. Today, I am so excited to have the pleasure to interview Kemi Joy Johnson. You may know her on Instagram as Kemi Birth Joy Johnson, and she is truly a gem. She is a midwife practicing in London in the UK. And she, her and I just feel like, Kemi, you're just such a kindred spirit. We were just talking about this, that everything you post and share about physiological birth and the woman's divine wisdom and and how our bodies are so equipped for this. It is just so in alignment with everything I talk about. And you were saying you feel the same way. So welcome to the yes. podcast. <laughs> so oh, great. thank you. Really excited to be here. Was really excited to get your invitation. And because I see your passion and I see your posts and you're quite funny too and in your face too. And I thought, yeah, we're quick, we're kindred spirit. Yeah. And um, I did just a quick correction, only just to save me having to pay some legal fees. I, I was, um, I'll tell you my, my, my progression. So from mother, um, I was an accountant at the time, um, uh, used to moonlight as a doula. Um, then became a student midwife, then an NHS midwife, which is like an establishment midwife, then an independent midwife, which was a glorious. I spent most of my time being an independent midwife. And then I deregistered. So I took myself off of the nursing and midwifery council register so that I could really serve women authentically and serve them, them in the center. I serve no other God but them. So I was doing that um, mm, instead yes. of being on the register. So I doing, oh, I am doing that. So doing that, I have to call myself a birth keeper because if I'm not on the nursing and midwifery council register, I'm not allowed to call myself a midwife. Okay, good to know. So you're, yeah, and your system in the UK is set up a bit differently than here. Yeah. Here, here, which is probably worth talking about because it can be a little yes. confusing for parents to try to decipher what do all these letters and codes and names mm. mean. Because mm. in the US, we have licensed midwife or direct entry midwifery. And then we have yeah. um, CNM, certified nurse midwives. And the yeah. certified nurse midwives go through nursing school first, then get yes. their midwifery license. So they have more medical training and expertise. Yes. So some families prefer the licensed midwives. They feel yes. a bit more holistic. Others prefer the more medically trained ones. Yes. Um, I think it's really about whichever one you feel most in alignment with. And then of course, in the UK, you're, you're, uh, this is a great um, talking point. You said you were an NHS midwife. Can you yes. explain like what that means? There's NHS, then there's independent, and now you're deregistered. So you're yeah, uh, you're considered. So I, a birth I call keeper. myself a birth keeper. Yeah, gotcha. So um, the National Health Service have monopolized midwifery training in the UK. So you have to be trained by the National Health Service. Um, then with the academic work that you do with a, a university that works alongside. Um, the maternity units, uh, which depending on which area um, you're training in, um, you then, with combination of the two experiences and learnings, you then can apply to be on the register, the Nursing and Midwifery Council register. There's a problem. This is for another podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> it being nurse, nursing and midwif midwifery combined is an issue. I might, you know, people say, well, you would say that because you're a direct entry midwife. I didn't do a full learning degree and then do a postgrad for midwifery. What I what I did was go into direct entry. So that's a three year degree for midwifery. Um, learning, you know, we we did rotations through gynae and A and E, you know, emergency room and everything. We did all theatres, so we could learn some of what the nurses learned but then we branched off and, and completed our degree with midwifery skills 
Um, because the National Health Service have the monopoly on that route, on, on the routes to registration, we, uh, you know, all I learned in, um, oh, I've got to remind me of swearing as well. I didn't check if I could do that. But all <laughs> I all I knew, all I learned was how to mess up birth. We didn't learn how to support physiological birth. Yes. I had to learn that with independent midwives who took me under their wing in the second year of training when I actually thought I was going mad. So, mm-hmm. and and what was what was pushing me over the edge was women being abused in the services. So it's one thing to not know how to support physiological birth. So I was being mentored in those services as part of my training. It's one thing them not knowing how to facilitate it, but actively sabotaging it, disrespecting women, the misogyny and the violence pushed me to my yeah. absolute limit. So, you know, they they patched me up, the independent midwives have all retired now. They patched me up and then said, please just go and get your registration. So I went back in, snatched the the rest of my training got my registration wasn't very long in the NHS at all before I was out as an independent mm. yeah and as an independent does that mean you're practicing at home and in the hospital yeah just, okay so you really just have good your question own yeah. yeah really good question we're mostly at home we'll follow a woman this is the independent midwife I'm now a birth keeper so they don't recognize me as a midwife, which is kind of good, actually. Um, <laughs> but when I was on the register, um, if I went into a hospital with a woman, they would try to tell me, oh, well, just sit down and shut up. You're a doula. But mm. because I was on the register, if I didn't call out bad practice, you know, not only could my client, you know, throw me under a bus, but so would my registering body. I'm supposed, if I spot bad practice or unsafe practice, I'm supposed to call it out from another registrant. Mm. So, so it was good because sometimes I'd go in and rather than them, you know, doing something horrible to my client, which I wouldn't allow anyway, they would say, actually, you can facilitate physiological third stage better than I can. And, you know, by law, they ought to step aside, acknowledging Mm. that I was better at something. So quite regularly, I would assist with the facilitation of the the placental birth, even though though I'm on the hospital premises, I would do that. Or, you know, a woman giving birth upright, etc., keeping a woman out of the supine position in lithotomy you know yeah. that's no good for birth so right and I think so, this yeah, is actually I actually love that about the UK I feel like that is one thing they get right I know there's lots of problems both in the US and the UK with mm. all of these restrictions and ways of managing and and frankly abusing women in, in childbirth and sabotaging childbirth like you that's mentioned right. we have these these major issues that that you and many others in this birth world are addressing. But one thing I do love th- that you mentioned is that if your client, home birth client, transferred to the hospital, you would yeah. continue be able to legally continue to care for her and facilitate yeah. her birth yeah. or her third stage of labor, the delivery, the, the placenta, the pushing. Whereas yeah. in the US, with a home birth transfer, you you pretty much surrender a lot of your autonomy at least the midwife is no longer yeah. legally caring for you it's it's you're at home with the midwife and then when you transfer she might hang around but she has no league like she she's not no longer your provider the hospital doctors yeah. are your provider Horrible. and what Horrible. they say goes so there's much less continuity of care yeah. in the US yeah. and yeah. they yeah. frown I can imagine. they judge and frown upon home birthers in yeah. <laughs> in many ways now yeah. i've had oh no we, we do that here we yeah. do that here it's just <laughs> it's just that when i was on the register you know i could i you know i could say well you don't know what you're doing step aside and they yeah. respected you as as a registered midwife. Oh, no, no, it wasn't respected. <laughs> <laughs> well, they at least let you you practice in the hospital. Uh, yeah, that, well, it, it's it it depends. I could have just stood aside and let my clients yeah. be butchered and you know whatever else. But by law, because I was on the register, I can say you could you stand don't know up what and- you're doing. Yeah, uh, you know, I'll take care of this. I've been left in the room by pouty NHS midwives who didn't like 
that I knew the third stage better than them. They just swing <laughs> out the door, you know. Um, so so right. it's, it's not respected, not particularly honoured. And to be honest, they've virtually stamped out all independent midwives in the UK anyway. There's only a handful yeah. of us, a handful of them left. I keep saying us because I really identify <laughs> with independent midwives. But yeah, now as, an, as, a, as a birth keeper, if I go in with a mm. person... Um, and you know, they say, and I make a suggestion and they don't like it. And then my client knows my skill set. So I'll say, well, they want to do this, this, and this to you. And then they'll say, oh, you can't talk. You're not on the register. We'll get security. Mm. And then I can say to my client, would you like to leave with me? <laughs> so, so if, you know, either way you can work it's, around it. It's all a power play, right? It's, it's all right. a power play and who has the credentials, who's in charge, who, you know, and, right. and in the medical model, they, they, they only respect credentials. They were in your case, the registry is your name on there. And even yeah. then we're going to look down on you, but you yes. had, you had some legal grounding to step up and, and actually facilitate. Yes. Whereas in the U S you know, I've been a part of ho- hospital transfers and the midwife has no authority in the hospital after that transfer. My word. You know, my it's, word. she just sits there quietly and supports emotionally. Like they're not oh, going wow. to listen to her. They might, they might respect her skill as, mm. um, you know, just out of professionalism, but mm. legally they can't even defer to her to make decisions because they are wow. 100% liable in the hospital now. Like if wow. once you go there, they are. And that's, I think, one of the biggest problems in the U.S. is the mm. pressure that lo- medical lawsuits and liability put on doctors and nurses. Yeah. They're so terrified of yeah. th- the ramifications of being sued that everything is over-medicalized, over-intervening, over-management. Because yeah. what if you didn't? If you didn't, then you'll – and something, something yeah. bad happened, then you get sued. So they yeah. over – you know, cross all their T's and dot their I's, which is yeah. to the detriment of of women. And so it's a slightly different system, but still at the foundation, it's 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 a foundation of fear and management and control. Mm. And so mm. you have it different is. different laws, different rules, different and, and I think it's interesting you're saying that even the independent midwives are, are being eradicated. You know, that oh, this, yeah. the system does not tolerate, it sounds like. No, and community midwives and home birth midwives and continuity of care midwives. Anyone who there's a hope of having a healthy sacred birth with, um, they're, they're stamping us out, they're eradicating mm. us. I just want to, you know, I want to toot the horn for the UK as well because they beat the US because they're cutting open 50% of women to extract their babies, whilst I think in the US you're only at 40%. It's about 33, depending oh. on what state, d- depending on national average is 33. It's been plateaued there wow. for, for about 20, 30 years, but Wonderful. it depends on the state. Some states are 40, some states, yeah. you know, depending also on the hospital and the practice, yeah. but you guys are 50% cesarean yeah. across yeah. the board. We've got a couple of hospitals that reported a 58% cesarean rate in That's a September. Shame. I know. Is this a inc- recent increase? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was it was getting really bad anyway, and then they've now excelled themselves. So, congratulations, UK. <laughs> not a prize you want to win. <laughs> it's not a prize no. you want to win. Oh no! Well, I mean, the US <laughs> recently had um, the a decline in infant death stats that are how. Right, like nowhere else in the world are infant is infant mortality decreasing. It's it's I should say it's improving. It's improving everywhere I else s- in the world, and in the U.S. for oh, the last two years, I see. It, it, no, it, we it no we we we're with you. Yeah, we oh, got went worse. down there too. We got more dead oh, babies. babies. Yeah, yeah, right, more more dead babies. More dead which, babies. Which yeah. it hasn't declined for. Like since the seventies, I think, and no. only recently in the last two years during COVID has it wow. gone down. And it's like, yeah, can we learn something from this that more management well, no, and doesn't it's save clearly, babies? <laughs> it's, it, more management doesn't save babies, and it's got nothing to do with the COVID jab either. But let's move on. 
<laughs> Let's move on. Let's talk about your how how was your confidence crushed in this system? And you mentioned being coerced, complying. Yeah. Is that what you were yeah. sharing about earlier, where you were forced to work in this system? Like, tell me more about that. Yeah, it, I mean, they they used to play with us as independents. Oh, you've got some insurance, and they haven't. Oh, could you help us with insurance then? Because then we can work. No, we're not going to help you either. And we're going to work with another private company to make sure that the independent midwives, it was all the politics. Yeah. And and then, you know, I had some I had some Googleable clients. And what, what happened? If you've got Googleable clients, I mean, I'm quite Google Googleable myself now because of my mouth, because I, I run it. <laughs> but um I I had some Googleable clients and when when there was an insurance issue, rather than everyone behaving like an adult, they assigned a, one person to Google me, find out who I, you know, who's been celebrating a birth that I was a part of, then finding out their contact details, then contacting them to find out if I'd attended their births. So it is so what it was, it, and you know, not so much of the independence. But there was always this undertone for registration, like I'd get threatened. Like people would say, oh, you attend to breach a breach baby at home. That sounds dangerous. I might let your registrant know. You know mm. what I mean? Like there's all that, that threat all the time of having to sit and answer for why you're using your very well honed skills to help a woman have a healthy birth. <sighs> like that yeah. sounds backwards to me. I don't want to waste time doing that. Yeah. So, I, I, and so, and also be real. Um, I, 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 I'm quite active in groups that were, that had traumatized women in them. Mm. And they would talk about how they were tra- traumatized by a registered midwife. Mm. And it, it began to make me quite nauseous and ill and tearful to mm. be aligned with people that would do that. So in the yeah. end, I thought, ditch the registration, best thing I ever did. Mm. Now I just work direct for the woman. The women. So, so you know, there's not many of us here in the UK that do that. There are becoming more of us. I must admit it's growing, particularly over the last year when many more women are choosing to free birth. It's like, it's like they literally going, oh, uh, I think I'm having a baby. I call the midwife. Uh, you know why oh because they might fuck up my birth you know it's like it's such a sad state of affairs I remember you know two decades ago when you said you're a midwife or whatever people would still love and respect you give you a cuddle and whatever and be quite starry-eyed about you not that I was in it for that but now it's difficult to say oh you know I thankfully I don't have to but like like, oh my I'm a midwife and then someone will tell you how um, a midwife put her in a sotomy, lied to her, held her down whilst her perineum yeah. was cut with an episiotomy scissors. You see what I mean? You just don't yeah. know. Now, if you say what you do, you, it's 50 50, right? The kind of response you're going to yes. get. And that's true here, too. I'm learning, you know, the more yeah. I talk to women and hear stories of women who said, Well, I had a midwife, but she, you know, like told me was telling yelling at me to push or she was inducing me at 39 weeks and these yeah. midwives are practicing with the same you know in the same way that an OB practices and it's hard yes, to right. know now because I I so advocate for midwives and the midwifery model of care but just because yes. someone calls themselves a midwife especially yeah. if they're working in a hospital system and that hospital yeah. has certain ways of doing things that doesn't mean you're going to get the midwifery, midwifery level care. of care. That's right. And, and there's uh, there's more. Unfortunately, it's not clear cut here, here or there. And wow. And it's it, it, you have to really do your homework and really you know discuss yeah. the things you want and and yeah. and and interview the midwife you want. You have to interview yeah. them. And and do you really? I mean, I might I might actually um, create a resource to help people how you know how to know if they're speaking to a real midwife or not because they we kind of abuse the yep. term it's amazing because i'm actually a real midwife i'm a true midwife i you know i i reflect i test myself um how however the people that are registered midwives that are working in the nhs you've got about 95% of them 
are obstetric nurses. Mm. They work to the obstetrician. They work to obstetric policies. They lie to um, the woman sat Mm. there in front of them or the perfect person. They lie to them about their capabilities. All your baby's too big. All your perineum's too short. All you're too fat. You know, they are rank misogynists. In a way, um, you know, people may have heard me say this before, I hold the midwives more responsible for the trauma that we're going through because we've been groomed that we can trust them. Mm. So the level of betrayal is higher. At least, you know, in my culture, um, because doctors have harmed us, you know, black people so many times, I, I, I was bred with, you know, this instinct to not trust doctors, Mm. but I was taught to trust a midwife. So it's, it's really um, traumatic to be let down by someone you perceive as a sister, as an ally. You know, it's, it's a very, very unusual, devastating situation, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And I and I and I understand the women who choose to free birth or choose to birth without medical assistance for for all the reasons you're mentioning because mm-hmm. their trust has been so betrayed by yeah. doctors or even midwives, you know, who in previous births or in just the research they've done and realizing I don't want that <clears throat> kind I don't want someone meddling with my birth in that way and yeah. so you do a beautiful job of really yeah. describing you know it's because this is you're you're not just about like well I'm going to attack and speak against the you know establishment or the NHS but we're and and I feel like it's a fine line as an influencer I'm not trying to create fear mm. and make it us versus them and mm. and demonize the medical system mm. even though there's mm. there's much to be you know corrected but that's I don't feel like that's my job and I don't and I know that you have a higher calling as well in this that you truly are empowering women in physiological birth and I I believe if we can help women understand the power of their bodies that mm. all the control all the the rules all the management it's like it becomes like irrelevant not irrelevant but at least like laughable like you're no longer subject to it you're like yeah. well why would I do that my body knows what to do yeah, and it's, it's like so when true. women get this and they're so they're no longer controlled they're no longer yeah. under the thumb of yeah here's all the hospital policy you have to abide by and oh my doctor yeah. said this and I'm not allowed to that it's like yeah. all of that is just like BS when we realize the power we carry and I I truly love how you work with women in empowering them in their autonomy, in their birth preparation, and in teaching about physiology. And I'd love to hear your take on that and what you've learned and in how Mm -hmm. you incorporate physiology and just empowering women in physiological birth. Because a lot of my listeners are, are pregnant women or couples preparing for birth. What are some of the things they need to know, regardless of where they're birthing? Mm. And actually, half my audience births in hospitals, the other half at home. So I have a really beautiful mix. And and, and of course, yeah, I empower women no matter where they choose to birth, because truly it comes from within. Like if we, if we really get this, like not that it's going to, it's going to be more of a battle in a hospital, no doubt, but absolutely. Yeah. That internal confidence is what really matters. And I'd love to glean from a midwife who has been uh, practicing as such an expert, truly an expert in physiological birth. I would love to hear I from am. you. How can couples, how can women best prepare for birth physiologically? How beautiful. What a beautiful opportunity as well. For you to have a 50-50 listenership is wonderful. And um, I mean, in this country, we've still got 95% of babies being born on the labor ward or in the theater. Yeah. So, you know, there's you know, there's a small amount of people that will genuinely be able to practice what I'm saying, because even though it comes from within, environment will determine whether you're actually able to express the fullness of your capability um, literally by doors being opened people telling you scary stuff people coming and standing in front of your vagina with three or four strangers to tell you scary stuff that's all going to affect what however strong you are inside so you know part of my part of my um what I want to express to people that want a spontaneous physiological birth is you're really going to need 
to buckle down to figure out why you feel you're safer out of your home. Where does that come from? Where does that belief come from? Um, Just to give you and your baby the best chance of not being harmed. We've done the studies too many times. You and your baby are subject to more harms on the on the labour ward, or um, even if the. So sometimes the studies look at certain parameters and outcomes, um, and you'll never see them measuring how many babies received um, an optimal microbiome via their mother's vagina. You won't see measured whether the babies received their full blood complement. So, you know, when here in the UK, when an eighth of an adult blood complement is removed from them, you know, i.e. 500 mils, you get a cup of tea and a biscuit. When we cut away, you know, when we clamp off a third of a baby's, a third, much bigger than an eighth, a third of a baby's blood complement, with you know delayed cord clamping which isn't long enough or immediate cord clamping the baby doesn't receive anything to compensate for that loss of fluid right so you know so I I really would encourage well what I do when I'm preparing couples is encourage them to see that they cannot outsource their safety Um, to the labour ward when it's been proven time and time again it's the least safe place for you and your baby to give birth except in exceptional circumstances you know every single person I've looked after whether they be type 1 diabetic um, you know essentially hypertensive um, whether they have seizures whether they've got a BMI of 45 They've all given birth safely at home. Mm. It can be done, um, you know, with intelligent, um, experienced care. So, but take it back to literally what the couple can do. Um, First of all, start considering preconception, what your current health status is. Have you had blood work, tissue, hair analysis? find out what your um if if there's anything that you can improve mineral wise supplement wise yeah. um look at what you're eating um you know as, as your if if you've got a male partner it, you know how is his sperm and semen kept is he wearing tight um shorts is he smoking weird stuff you know, all of this, take it, if you're planning children, it's, it's your responsibility to be in your best health. Yeah. If you're, if you're planning children, it's your responsibility to ensure that you have the resources to buy your village because village, you know, the village it takes to, to raise a mother and her baby um used to be in situ you lived with them you lived next to them you you lived in the same compound as them that's not the case anymore you have to buy them because who used to make up your village may be part of a household where they need two incomes so your mother can't take three months off to assist you anymore or you know she may not have a pension or you, you know your your father may have been laid off There's so many reasons why you need to buy a village now. If you're planning your children, it's your responsibility to plan your resourcing of your village and and being just straight up. Yeah, no, that's a good good word because it's true. It's not free today. You do. You have to pay for it. You have to plan for it. Please. Otherwise, you're going to sit there and be alone and bitter, like looking for your village. And yeah. That unfortunately, that is just the reality of the modern culture we live in is that we have to re- allocate resources to yeah. pay for a postpartum doula, a pelvic floor yep. therapist, you know, yep. meals. I mean, meal yep. trains are great and pulling on the resources and family and friends you have for support, yeah. though, and recognizing those people who are going to support you and not just come over to hold the baby. There's a the big difference. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Words got to be said. Yes. Honestly, you don't need that. Your baby just needs to be pressed against your chest, pressed against yours or their father's chest. That's, that's it, please. Yes. It's, um, it, it, you know, and, and I agree with Karen, the meal train 
serves a purpose. But honestly, you've then got to think about allergies. Um, you know, you don't want to look forward. You don't want to defrost the meal, look forward to it and then hate it. You know, it's, it's <laughs> right. like, you know, with right. the best intentions, everything yeah. you put in your mouth postpartum matters. And in all honesty, you know, I recommend people like Lily Nichols, um, yes. you know, the first 40 days, etc. cetera. Yes. How, you know, Lily Nichols says how you eat postpartum actually makes is more essential than how you eat during your pregnancy. Mm, Like how you eat postpartum is everything. So, you know, and, and, you know, prepare yourself for breastfeeding. You know, a lot of people want to argue about it. There is the, the, the argument settled breast um, milk has the constituents required to grow a healthy human, human milk, for human babies okay yes. there's no two ways about it everything <laughs> else yep. everything else is a substitute yeah and you know did you know don't shoot me that's just the way we're made <laughs> it's, it's, it's true right? i know it's yeah. true and I, I just love that you you know talk about this when when i ask about physiological birth and what how a couple can prepare you don't just talk about the birth as a midwife you are interested in the their holistic care from yeah. con- preconception through yeah. postpartum and yeah. I, and i'm listening sitting here listening to you saying this is a true midwife a true midwifery model is someone Thank who's you. interested in that family's entire childhood pregnancy family planning journey what are you doing yeah. in preconception to stay healthy what are you doing in pregnancy to eat healthy what what is your partner doing to have healthy sperm how are you preparing for the postpartum you're like a doctor's not going to ask you those questions in a hospital an ob will not give two rips about what you eat in your postpartum period (laughs) this is truly if you're sitting here going well this is not how to prepare for birth yes it is yes yes it it is is. (laughs) oh yes it is and this is this Ooh. is a midwife who's going to ask you about these things. And if you're a doctor or a midwife is not asking you about these things, it might be time to find someone who does truly care about you. You need to find someone who really yes. cares about you, really cares about the building blocks of your baby, really cares. I was speaking to a mother the other day, you know, I'm jumping around a bit, but hopefully um, the couples <laughs> will get it. You know, I was speaking to her. Um, she's so beautiful. Um, she went on and had a home birth after cesarean at yeah. home but an early conversation we had was oh you know um how how is your body because her first birth really didn't go according to plan so I just started you know eventually after a bit of a conversation I said so how, what's your body like like you know do you have aches and pains any previous injuries and she started laughing because she said like her whole childhood it's as if she was intentionally trying to break her body <laughs> and I said and I said, and then you expected, you know, a perfect human to emerge from this <laughs> broken body. And she was laughing. And then, you know, and she said, but I said this to the midwife the first time and, and she had nothing to offer. And I said, well, yeah, if you've got injuries, that means you may have referral pain. That means you may be carrying yourself in a slightly different way that may not be conducive to a baby coming out of your vagina. So you've got to think about previous injuries. You've got to think about what modalities you're using for injuries. It's like some people have said, I've got a great chiropractor. I go there every two months and I have adjustments. And then I ask them, I say, so why are you having to go every two months? Like, Mm. what's happening? (laughs) And then, you know, from my study of fascia, and I think I will become a bone therapist because I'm so fascinated by it. If your fascia is misaligned or wounded, but you have someone going in and adjusting your musculature, your cartilage, your skeleton, the fascia is going to pull it back out again. So that's why you need to repeatedly keep going. Whilst for me, I can go to my bone therapist and not go again for a year. Hmm. you know yeah. and when I go back it's, it'll be for something some other silly thing I've been doing with my body like you yeah. know hanging out of a car window you know slanted and stuff like that or yeah. having a bad mattress or something so you know the other thing I think about is your body alignment so as muscle but so as muscle um holds fear, um, fear and tension yes you know so you know what are we doing with that we can't just do physical things with it we have to go to the seat of the problem the fear and tension where's yes. that coming from what's happening in your mindset have you got buried worries are you that person that says 
I'm really scared of labour and birth. I'll just put on a happy face and whistle a happy tune. That's not the way to approach it. Or I'll just go with the flow or I'll just do whatever my doctor says. Oh my God. (laughs) God forbid to go with the flow. You really, really go to rack. Especially not with underlying trauma and fear. That is because the flow is going to be chaos and panic and anxious and doctors telling you what to do and taking your power. And that's not the flow you want. (laughs) It's not the flow you want. And what I always say as well in my posts, I try and say, if you're not going to do it for you, please do it for your baby. Yes. because a lot of us feel and I'm myself included feel oh well I'll just do this I'm really uncomfortable about waiting till my baby sends their signals so uh you know if I've not given birth by 41 weeks I'll let them force my baby out mm-hmm. have you have you thought about the effect on this little right. human yeah yeah right that you maybe that you maybe. really really want to be good to you really want to love this human and the first act you know where you where you really have power is you you disregard this little human yeah. and have them pounded out of your body with Pitocin. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's, it boggles my mind how we so rarely consider the experience of the baby in the birth process. Yeah. yeah. And and they are having a human experience they, and they yeah. will remember it, in, if not consciously, oh, yes. in their body. Their bodies will oh, tell yes. the story in the postpartum for yeah. potentially months or years of that trauma and yeah. we just think, oh, well, it's just a colicky baby or, oh, well, they just don't sleep or they they don't eat or da, 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 da. And yet there's lots of things. I'm not saying all like colic is from trauma, but it, there, there's there, there's only one way a baby can express and that's through yeah, crying. And that's if we just right. think we can pummel Pitocin and then get the epidural and then get all the drugs and then suction them out or forceps yeah. them out and that they're not yeah. going to have lasting effects or some impact from that, we yeah. are going in blind. And yeah. we need to consider the full impact. I 100% agree with you. 100%. It's not just about us. It's about it's about the experience our babies are having. And are we even connecting to them? Like, I mean, that's a that's a big consideration, even just for not just for an induction, but for getting pain medicine and an epidural, because that epidural disconnects you from your baby. And they're 100%. now suffering the intensity of the contractions without that maternal. Alone spiritual connection right they're doing it yeah. alone and there's ways you can you can intentionally bond and in, in that you know in your intuition and your spirit reach out to them but it changes the experience and it, right. and it changes the labor it changes the physiology it, it changes the entire ball game once you introduce drugs in the system that's right 100 percent couldn't have said it better and so it's those kind of thoughts that i would love parents to have in mind um before they become pregnant yeah. yeah. And and a lot of people, you know, they may just have a happy accident after, you know, uh, uh, you know, having a lot of a boozy weekend, let's say. Um, but honestly, we we say we love our children. And, you know, I, I'm speaking to myself, too, because I don't want anyone to not realize that I, too, accepted an induction that cascaded to a cesarean for my first child. Mm-hmm. So, I'm, I'm I'm just saying, don't do what I did. Okay. Yeah. I want, I want you to really think about it. And even if, you know, you have a busy weekend and find yourself pregnant, um, please from that moment on, do everything you can to enable you to have the, the whole health and the courage to stick by your baby. Even when 36 weeks hits and you're showered in the dead baby card. So that, you know, and, and they're all at it and it's mean, it's mean to threaten the well-being of a baby, a mother with the well-being of a baby. And they do it after 34 weeks when your amygdala, the little risk uh, assessment part of your brain um, is very sensitive because you can't see your feet and your center balance is completely off. And so you're feeling extra vulnerable. You couldn't really run from danger and things like that. So your amygdala becomes more sensitized. It's an amazing adaptation, except you're doing it with criminal hell-bent maternity services. So they know that after 34 weeks, they can pounce on you with any irrational fear and you'll suck it all in and be very malleable and do exactly as they say. So the only thing I can hope to reach you with 
is, you know, at, you know, once you hit that stage, is to whatever statistic they give you, for, for a start, check it because they all are times in statistics by 100. So if something says it's, if, if something's 0.2% or 10, they're 10 timing it or 100 timing it, if something's 0.2%, they'll give you, they'll tell you it's 2%. If something's 2%, they'll tell you it's 20%. Or it's because two they times more risky or 10 times oh, more likely. Yeah. And which is relative risk, risk, not relative actual. Risk. Yes. Yeah. They do that you all know, the time. You're, oh, your you're increase, you know, odds of stillbirth are, t- are 10 times higher after f- 41 or 42 weeks. And it's like, yeah, yeah. it's still 0. 0.00002% right. percent. if you ask That's them, what right. are the actual chances of stillbirth? Yeah. Get the actual numbers because they yeah. make it sound so scary. And when you have yeah. that very tiny number multiplied by 10, it's still a very tiny number. It's now, that, really tiny that number. might be too big a number for you, but it's your right to know what the actual number yeah. is and then make yeah. that decision. I, absolutely, 100%. And as Karen says, you know, it, it may be, it may, if it's too big a number for you, I really want you to feel into that. I want you to feel into... What am I going to put me and my baby through because I think that number is too big, right? So, mm. and I will tell you, most of the risks that they're waving in front of you, for the vast majority of you, are a difference of 0.1 or 0.2%. So let's take, for example, in the UK now, we've we've had more or less a doubling of the stillbirth rate. So it used to be 2%, but not 0.2%. Forgive me, 0.2%, guys. <laughs> it used to be 0.2%. It's now around 0.4%. Um, but it's got nothing to do with anything that's happened in the last three years. But we'll move on. Right. So <laughs> I'll have so, to pick your brain about that later. I'm so curious. <laughs> so essentially, it's doubled. Yeah. But, but so they're making all of these suggestions that include like a little screw, which they'd like to call a clip, but it is a screw that goes into your baby's scalp to monitor the baby and everything else. And they're pitocin, uh, we're going to end your pregnancy right away with some dilapan rods or a balloon catheter or all the other weird and wonderful things they've dreamt up to do to women, a panel of men usually. Um, so, they, <laughs> yes. so they're doing all of that to reduce... Um, you know, because they they will tell you that your chance of um, cuddling your baby, a live baby, after this pregnancy, instead of being 99.8%, is only 99.6%. But so you can see, and like I say, it's doubled, the risk has doubled, right? Yes, and yeah. you'll go, oh my God. That's why you've got to flip the stat. Whenever they give you a real stat, not a fake one, so you might have to dig for the real one. Your people standing in front of you usually don't know it. Um, so find out what the real stat is and then take it from 100 and then you've got your percentage. You will always find that you've got at least 99% chance of cuddling your well baby, you know, until they don't want you to cuddle them anymore and they want to borrow your car and, you know, bring their boyfriends home and stuff. It's, <laughs> it's, it, I, I'm telling you, you'll see it's a tiny figure. And then if you're still not willing to, Take courage for your baby. Ask yourself, why not? Why am I able to live with a 0.2% difference? Why am I? So you need to, and these are, this is the deep work. Those are good questions. Yeah, those are good questions. This is the deep work. This is, this is where you've got to question what you think about death because literally none of us are getting off of this planet alive. None of us not one. Okay. So you've got to examine your feelings about death. You've got to examine whether to you, there are things worse than death. There's somebody I'm very in full admiration of at the moment, a mother, um, Katie Spinks, who was speaking out on Instagram about what happened to her when she accepted an induction because everyone's clutching their pearls thinking, (gasps) did one of them die? Well, no, um, her daughter is very harmed. And mm. so you, you've, yes, you, and I've she's heard of living this. with that. And it's changed both of, well, her daughter's life is a challenge yeah. and, and her life has changed forever. And so you, you've got to 
You've got to question yourselves. What are you prepared to put your, if not even you don't care about you, what are you prepared to put your baby through because of uncomfortable feelings mm-hmm. ab- yeah. about your birth and your, your pregnancy ending spontaneously? Mm, so yeah. There's a lot of mind work I want. But I, you know, if you're thinking about having children, you're planning children, you've got to dig down into your value system. Does it match your partners? Are you on the same page? Yeah. Are they are they are they full of fears and biases that means that they will throw you under a bus? Mm, just for, yeah. just for self preservation because they can't cope with uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. It's, these are things that you've got to ask yourself. Does your partner trust you? Do they actually trust you? Because the baby's inside of you, so there needs to be a hundred percent trust there. Yeah. And if there isn't, it could cause a problem. Yep. That's good. That's a really good word. Like learning. I think that the journey of pregnancy in many ways for women, especially first time moms is really so much about learning to step in our own confidence and power and not outsource our faith or assurance to someone else on the outside. And I hear women all the time ask me and DM me, like, oh, my doctor said this and this, you know, what should I do? Or like my my midwife or my husband said this, they're not comfortable with home birth, they're not comfortable with, or that I, I should get an induction because I have X, Y, Z thing going on. You know, what do you think? I, and I obviously I can't give medical advice. I'm a doula. I'm not, I'm not a midwife, but I also yeah. recognize there is this need for assurance and like a grasping for, I need somebody to tell me it's safe to do what my gut knows I'm supposed to do. And no one's going to give you that assurance that has to be developed internally. And you sister have to know I am called as this child's mother and God has given me supernatural, divine motherly intuition to make these tough decisions in the face of fear and coercion and manipulation. And that also includes Mm the decision to maybe go into the hospital or get the medical assistance you need because you know intuitively something's off and something's not okay with my baby. It's both and. And it's not that anyone can assure you 100% your baby's going to be okay. Nobody, if if a doctor's telling you that, Report him because nobody knows. Nobody can tell nobody you. Nobody knows. There's, there's no, no one can assure you if you have a home birth, if you wait until 42 weeks or if you do or you don't, that everything will go perfectly. There, That's there's right. always risk. There is, and there is absolutely risk to an induction, to birthing in a hospital. There's risk to waiting, but know those yeah. risks. But, and even more importantly, know, have the assurance in yourself because that knowing goes deeper than <clears throat> the, the stats and the 0.002% chance and comparing this versus that and all the opinions of everyone around you, it goes deeper, the knowing and connecting to your baby. And is, yes. is this baby okay? What's going on? Is my body okay? Is my body healthy and functioning? Or do I need some help? D- does my body yes. or my baby need some help in some form, whether that's supplements, whether that's a medical intervention, whether that's a, a you know, a castor oil pack or, or you know, whatever it is, yes. there's lots of options, but don't run around like crazy, like a, like a chicken with your head cut off thinking, I got to get this baby out because somebody scared you that he was, that yes. that baby was about to die and your placenta was about to fail. You know, you know, inside yes. this is, this is what your intuition is saying and stop looking for reassurance to everyone else around you. Yeah. When, when it, yeah. that knowing comes from within, it comes from your source. So yes. that's, oh, I don't know. I got on a rant there, but I felt like somebody needed I, to hear that. <laughs> that was, yeah, I was just, thank I you would for love, saying that. I want to ask you about pushing and how you coach mm. women or or not coach women or how you facilitate or support, I should say support would be a better way to ask it. How do you support pushing or the pushing stage with your clients? Oh, I love this one because there's <laughs> there's a baby that's just a few days old, um, born to a first time mother. Um, she prepared really well during her pregnancy. Um, me, her, and her beloved, we had quite a few uncomfortable conversations because they're first time birthers and they were preparing in a way that most people around them weren't preparing. So, and you know, as you can tell I can be a bit confronting sometimes but it comes it <laughs> comes good from way. a good place it comes, it comes from, from love a good place. yeah it does come from love um and then 
she went into spontaneous labour and she was having a home birth and she was in the pool and she's been beautifully served by her husband, um, her sister. So they're not related, but she's definitely a, an angel walking on the planet and her beautiful, humble mother. And they served her by doing deep work during the during the pregnancy. So it wasn't just her and her husband, but her mother and her Resty. They also did the deep work and then the labor started and the physical ardor of it. Um, it was very arduous um, because it was her first and, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And there's a lot of unknown and unexpected and, and it's all clicking together nicely. And I'm not saying a word. Okay. So, you know, people might say, God, what do they pay you for, Kemi? But I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not saying a word. It's like, you know. A good midwife knows how to sit on her hands and do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm, I, I'm so used to sitting. I don't even need to sit on my hands anymore. I can sit with a piece of cake and a cup of tea. And then um, in the end, I see them all. Well, she's out of the pool again and she's. On the sofa, she's in the loo first of all, then she's on the sofa. Because I love the way women instinctively move when they're in labor. Mm, they yeah. kind of careen around. It's so beautiful. So she's on the sofa. And then I just suggest maybe lie on your left hand side and have a little sleep. And you know, she has a sleep cry. And then I see, and I'm sitting outside with another cupper and another slice of cake. And then um <laughs> I see I see her her beloved team leaving the room slowly looking a bit distraught and I said what happened she said oh she told us to get out <laughs> so, so, and so nice. and so they did and they were very worried about it and I assured them that they'd be able to hear when the baby's coming so they won't miss it and they heard and recognized so I didn't give I didn't tell her anything she just started panting <laughs> and then she called her husband and then he went in and I heard her say, the head's out, catch the baby. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I don't coach pushing. <laughs> I don't I coach pushing. Answer. I love that answer. <laughs> yes. It, Oh, that's, to do. that like makes my heart full <laughs> you have no idea <laughs> because so oh so many midwives still think you oh, have to Karen. force push a baby out did oh. you give her any vaginal exams no no <laughs> so so what you're telling me must come down she, she you're telling me she knew intuitively oh i need time alone kicked everybody out yeah yeah um that baby descended she dilated yeah. fully her body pushed yeah. the baby out yeah. Push the head out, and then she called yeah. her husband to catch yeah. the baby. And That's nobody, right. nobody had to tell her what to do or how to push. No, no, <laughs> no. And and Nothing. is that how many? Is that just like a rare circumstance, or is that possible no. for anybody? No, you'll never hear me say push. It'll mm. never happen. <laughs> you can speak to all the hundreds of women I've supported in, in this one-to-one continuity care in the home birth. Yeah, You'll never hear me say the word push. When I was in units, we were taught that you had to do it. But the, thankfully, the independents got hold of me and said, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what did they say? Do I say like, tell them to push? What are you doing? So I said, do you, do, you know, we're a bit obtuse sometimes here in London, you know. So what, do you, do you follow her into the toilet and when she's having a crap and tell her when to push them? <laughs> That cures exactly, me. Exactly. That cures me. <laughs> oh my yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for they saying fixed that. Me. That's exactly they fixed what I me. tell women. Does someone have to tell you when to push your poop out? No. <laughs> okay. Tell me about this. Do you do in the UK? This is what I've heard, at least from some research I've done on on the second yeah. stage, and I've I've studied it extensively. Um, uh-huh. I've heard in the UK that they don't. They did a st- study years ago because they had yeah. extremely high rates of severe tearing, like four, yes. third and fourth stage tearing. And so yes. they implemented this new program at one hospital that said, we're not going to coach women to push. We're not going to say the word push. So they said, you're not allowed to tell women to push. And so they didn't. 
And the rates of severe tearing drops like 90 something percent from like, it was like a seven or 4%. I can't remember exactly to like less than 1%. And it was so remarkable that they said, we're implementing this all over the UK. We're not going to coach women to push or tell them to push. And that they, now I don't know if this is happening with all the, this was years send, ago. Send me the research. Uh, I you, will. Yeah. Uh, but ch- childbirth is thousands of years old. Oh, I know. So it's... There's, there's lots of old research that bears water, unlike today, where the majority of research is, you know, by industries that are making money out of the outcome. So right. they skew the hunches. Yeah. So, but it I, seems like, like that there's that at research. least some some understanding of that passive second stage where the baby is descending and rotating before, after after the mom is fully dilated, okay, you're 10 centimeters, and before they start pushing. Because in the US, that that stage, that time period doesn't exist. It's, oh, it doesn't exist. No, you're 10 centimeters, it's time to push. And they wow. might say, okay, well, well, we'll give it, we'll wait until you have the urge. And they come back 20 30 minutes yeah. later. Okay, yeah. you have the urge to push? And the mom's like, yeah, yeah I feel the pressure. And they, yeah. they don't know. So they go, I guess so. Yeah, I feel I feel pushy. Yeah. And I tell women, pushy is not the same thing as it's not the, same. the overwhelming urge to push. And your yeah. body's going to, it's okay if you feel pushy. Just yeah. let, because all those things, there's many things that have to happen that internal rotation and dilation, that yeah. pulling up of the cervix. There's, and I, I've heard they do a bit of a better job with the pushing phase in the UK. Now, maybe that's shifted with the well, the wiping out of the independent midwives, but um, well, here, here we butcher uh, you, it. Do you know, I think you're amazing to remind our listeners that things are changing. Things, things have changed, obviously, markedly for the worst. But we do, when I was being taught midwifery so that was in the noughties we did seem to have an appreciation of if a woman had had an a first time birth I, I think I can't remember the rules it's so long since I've worked in those environments but um I think you've got two hours passive descent before yes. pushing yes. if you had if a first time birth had an epidural on board or something um, you got one hour if you'd given birth before vaginally. So I think, yes, I remember. Yes. That um, alone, that that alone is, is unheard of here. We don't, we don't have those. It's unbelievable. Not, none of, there's no two hours or one hour. And I mean, and it sh- could be longer. It, it, it's even to set a time limit is very like archaic and, and yes, almost it is. linear and birth is not linear. Yeah. So even to say, oh, you get two hours and then you have to push is, is not is problematic but the fact that they yes. give you two hours as standard whereas in the u.s it's there is no two hours it's 10 centimeters yeah. all right let's get you on bed yeah. and you're on your back and yeah. start pushing and it Horrible. creates so many complications babies getting yes, stuck does. four yeah. hours pushing fourth yeah. degree tears yeah. because we didn't allow that baby to descend and yes. it boils my blood because it is standard yes. practice here and doctors have no comprehension of that passive descent that you just mentioned and at, at least it's it's there's some knowledge of it there but it's, yes. it's my soapbox <laughs> no, oh, right I'm really glad it's your soapbox I'm actually uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna go after it here because what sabotages we have of that process is like having a woman in lithotomy or saying to a woman I'm going to have my hand all over your perineum Mm -hmm. we've got something called a perineal bundle or OAC care yeah, tell, bundle. Tell, tell the which, what that what that is. Oh man, do I have to? Because it, <laughs> it boils my blood. It's, it's, okay, it's, we have that here oh. too. We might not call it the perineal bundle. We call it like managing the the second stage or the third stage, yeah. depending on what where it's it falls. Just mean. It's just mean. Um, yeah, we drafted it in, and like any other thing that's poorly evidenced and against birth physiology. We like to implement that faster than anything that's actually helpful for birth. So, you know, women are having strangers talking to them when they're about to meet their baby, um, telling them that they'll tear from front to back unless I have my hand all over your genitals. 
Hmm. So it's not it's not a case of oh I'll give you a warm compress to keep you comfortable. It's this deceit that if I if I hold your um if I hold your perineum in a grip something called a finished grip, if I hold it, then that means that I am responsible for for preventing you from having a horrible tear. Except they're having horrible tears at the front instead, urethral and clitoral tears. Oh, because wow. because the energy of the push is being directed up towards the vulva mm. rather than the perineum that is actually made. The perineum is made for tearing. Right. It heals so beautifully. Yeah. It can heal without sutures. Yes. But in so, but instead, you know, because of the small percentage of third and fourth degree tears, which we know would have been caused by induction, especially with pitocin. Um, IV, it changes or the way. pushing with your legs really stretched up. So That's it's right. stretching that perineum too. That's right. Because if you've got lithotomy position, just like Karen said, you're bringing the perineum in front of the baby and the baby is going kind of with gravity towards the perineum. Yeah. So how can it not tear? It has to go through you've it. Got, it has to go through it. And it doesn't have to go through it. But the way they position you, right. what else can, can happen? Then Would you got, say, let me ask you this along these lines. Would you say that all, most all third and fourth degree tears are due to how the, the team managed that stage? Mostly. Occasionally, you'll have a woman that's rushing. So mm. she's rushing to get the baby born because of some yeah. sort of fear. Yeah. Somebody who's having a vagina birth after cesarean may mm. be in a real rush because she knows this baby has to be born vaginally and mm. she might you know, have a third degree tear or you have somebody who's rushing because the the doctors have said, if if this baby's not born in 10 minutes, we're going to use forceps and she doesn't yeah. want forceps. Yeah. So she pushes that baby through a perineum that's not quite ready yeah. um, or the position one that we already talked about or the perineum is going to respond differently to pressure because of pitocin. They've, they've done that study. They found that people with IV Pitocin will more likely have a more severe tear, tear or tear more regularly because the perineum acts differently. If people have had an epidural and they can't sense how they're pushing the baby at the perineum, that's also an increased chance of a, of a big tear and obviously the use of forceps and yep. instruments or cutting an episiotomy that extends into a big tear. Yes. So with all of that, they've not changed any of that, but they just want to have their hands all over your vagina. Mm. Yeah, this yeah. this is, you know, all those things that I've mentioned yeah. that could be changed or improved. No, we don't want to do that. We just want it. In, increase the intervention right yeah and i've seen i've seen midwives with their hands all all stretching the perineum as baby's head is coming out Disgusting. and i and i just go why why like and then i literally and the mother's been say, like sit, tell tells her stop that hurts i don't like it. and she just keeps doing it. i'm like okay now <laughs> this, this is a violation here but it's so mm. standard for mm. for some providers to mm. just uh, totally blow through your your bodily autonomy and think that oh i'm yeah. helping you and you need to or i'm mm. going to put pressure here you need to know where to push so you can mm. push harder and faster and mm. if we really just didn't touch her at all mm. it would it would usually turn out just fine <laughs> yeah i used to have to have the tea and cake to stop me from practicing some of the nonsense that i was taught in my midwifery <laughs> um studentship but now i just prefer life that way so I don't do any of those <laughs> things anymore you see here the midwives what, knit, knit it's the, the yeah. granny midwives oh, and yeah. the knitters yeah <laughs> yeah you the you can, I love I, it I, I used to do knitting but now yeah the cake the cake has it but um I feel like what you're sharing is such gold and I'm really hoping that more and more people will hear this logic we're not saying that things don't go off piece sometimes. Of course they do. Um, everything in life, they've got this slight room for things to go the way you don't want them. There's some people that can't breathe normal air. There's some people that can't go out into the sun. There's some people that, you know, have a really bad reaction to water. 
there's, you know, there's all sorts of things that potentially could go wrong, but they're all rare. There are things in childbirth that could go wrong, but they're really rare. And so, and that's why we have women like you there for those rare situations. That's that's that's, right. That's why I love my midwives because I say they're not there to teach me how to birth. Like my body knows how to do that, but they're there for that one or two percent or less percent chance. Yeah, Yeah. or or even not necessarily life threatening things, but there are things they can do to support and help. Yeah, that that you know might be beneficial, not metal. (laughs) Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I love that. I love how you support women and just the, the beautiful trust you have in women and in the physiology of birth that is so rare, unfortunately rare these days, but also it's Mm -hmm. ancient and it's, it's basic and it's simple. It's logical. It's what we've been doing for thousands of years. It makes sense. And, And as someone who's gone through the whole system and seen how they practice and seen the abuses and seen like the, well, why are we doing this and questioned it and gone, Hmm, there's a better way. And I, mm. and I don't want, I can't participate in this anymore. I have to yeah. be true and authentic to myself. And that takes a lot of courage for someone. And so I would just, I just want to encourage any of our listeners, Um, you, I want to mention some of your resources and how women can find you because mm. you offer some beautiful supportive services to women who are facing, you know, fears. I love the questions you ask. If you're someone who said, you know what, I need someone to support me in birth and ask me those tough questions, or Mm. I need someone with experience who understands certain risk factors to be able to tell me straight up to my face, like, if this is really what the real risks or dangers are, if you need that second opinion um, from someone with expertise in this field, um, I encourage you reach out to Kemi on her Instagram um, at Kemi birth joy johnson and tell yeah. us about the the birth hours that you have for women yes so i have power hours i know it's a lot of people are having power hours now but what mine includes it could be time spent planning um a pregnancy a next pregnancy say if you've come through a birth that you know had challenges in it and you'd like to know how to set yourselves up as a family for an ex pregnancy and birth we could we can talk about that we can talk about a particular instance that's happening in your pregnancy you know somebody said that you have low pape you know so you know and taken away all your choices or if somebody says oh you know you're you're too small you know your bmi is too low and taking away all your choices or your baby's Mm. too big and taking away your choices or gestational diabetes and taking away all your choices, et cetera. I'm really good at the lateral thinking, the questioning, how else could we do this? You know, what's the safest option? You know, what are equally a safe options? What is a challenging option? You know, and, and everyone's heard me talk about physiological birth all day, but, you know, two weeks ago, I recommended a plan for Variant for somebody, and um, you know, so I'm not this person that yeah. you know is. Doggedly. Now I'm curious, what, 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 why did you recommend the cesarean? Right, okay, because the team she was with don't understand how to facilitate breech birth. Hmm. So um, then she had distance to the next hospital that do. She had trauma from the previous birth, and she was like. Well, you only find out whether the the baby can only be diagnosed as breech from around 36 weeks onwards. So she was like in her 37th week. And the upshot of it all when measuring that she hadn't really had an opportunity to heal from the first birth trauma. Mm. So that's going to affect how her body responds. Mm. And the fact that the team serving her sadly allowed themselves to be, well, it's criminally allowed themselves to be de-skilled. So they weren't Mm. aware how to safely facilitate a breech birth. Um, She had um, budgetary issues. So she couldn't hire an expert to come to her home. And she had a partner that really wasn't ready for a physiological birth of a breech baby. Mm. And so when taking all of that into account, despite me being able to give her options and send her links for the options, my recommendation was a planned cesarean at Mm. the unit that she knew. 
Yeah. Um, so then I, you know, obviously the later the better. So, you know, kind of wait for when you're feeling like the body is preparing to let go of the baby because your body expertly holds the baby in with this lovely thick cervix, this thick long cervix. And then as you start to get, you know, more mucousy discharge where your mucus plug is starting to come away and, you know, the more you're looking to check what time your hubby's coming home and things like that, that's your body, you know, the more colostrum you're waking up with, you know, mm. you're trusted onto your knuckles oh, yeah. overnight and things, you know, all of those are signs that your baby is coming into land. And when you're getting those signs is an is a kind place to Mm. plan the cesarean for mm. rather than planning it weeks in advance yeah. for a, a, a random number wow. so most, most that is so beautiful I just I I just want to come and how I I love how you took all things into consideration in her life and in her preparation mm. and her situation whether financial and, and emotional and mental and and for her that that was in in your expert opinion the best option and 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 it, two things it goes to show like Yes, we can birth breech babies. We're fully capable, but that doesn't mean it's right for every woman 100%. to pursue a home breech birth. There are all these factors that you mentioned. And two, we can have a cesarean and still treat ourselves and our babies and our bodies humanely and yes. honor the physiological yes. process happening, even as our bodies prepare for labor with paying attention to those signs that you mentioned that we can honor our bodies in its preparation to give birth, even in planning a cesarean, it doesn't mean, oh, everything's out the window. We're just going to yeah. have a cesarean. And 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 it's like this failure in a sense. And it doesn't yeah, have to be that way. That. We, can, we can make an honorable, like intuitive, wise decision and still honor our bodies right. in other ways, even when medical intervention is the best option. And so I actually think that's brilliant. And I love that you shared those details. I'm I'm really glad that you gave me an opportunity to share that because, you know, the power hour really is an hour of power. It's not just a um, power hour for people having spontaneous physiological free birth. You know, it's it's for everyone. Hmm. Um, I'm not going to ever lie to you, though. If you, you know, if you're saying, oh, you know, I want to have an honoring cesarean because there's an R in the month then I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the truth. Your baby would prefer a physiological birth, you know, that's going to set them up better for health, you know, but, but, um, but yeah, but we'll always have an honest conversation. I'll always mm. leave you for something with something to think about. Anyway. I love it. I love it. So if, if anyone out there wants an honest conversation, make sure you hit up Kemi and, yeah. and participate in those power hours. Well, thank Perfect. you so much, Kemi, for, for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom with us. It is, it is, it's just gold. There are so many gold nuggets that I, I think we have to walk away with from this. And thank, thank you for you. the work you do in supporting women. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Pain-Free Birth Podcast. If you were encouraged, it would mean so much if you left us a five-star review and shared this with your community. I'd love to connect with you on Instagram at Pain-Free Birth. And to learn more about the Pain-Free Birth eCourse, free resources, private coaching, and upcoming events. Find out more at painfreebirth.com. See you next week.